So hello again. We are, uh, um, so you saw me at the beginning and the opening and now you are seeing me again. So this means we are closer to closing now. So if you remember the first session, we opened our, our reflection and discussion on uh, ethical leadership for a re-envisioned future was a discussion about ethical leadership. And so this was the first part, like the beginning of our, our reflection, the foundation for our reflection, because this is the purpose also of the Global Ethics Forums is to provide reflection, thinking, discussion, and hopefully engagement also from this ethical uh, leadership perspective. But we also need, through the ethical leadership perspective, to have a better, brighter vision for the future. Uh, and not just to imagine this future, but also to look at the roadmap that can take us towards a better future. And um, and the, so the, the, the horizon, I would say, that we put is 2050, 25 years from now. Uh, you know that in um, uh, three weeks from now, so in New York, the new pact for the future will be launched, will be endorsed, will be launched. I, I, I don't want to go back to my uh, comments on this that I mentioned in the opening speech, but this is at the same time a big momentum, even though there are lots of also points that are disappointing, but we are here to complement what is missing and to fill the gap from, from, from this uh, in this global uh, political intergovernmental uh, process. And to fill the gap, we want to start with uh, great people that you met yesterday, you voted for, you, you celebrated at the winner of the uh, Youth Leadership Award that we launched in the framework of this, uh, uh, of this uh, Global Ethics Forum. And so first, I will, I will ask so our three winners to join me here on the stage, because with them, we want to start envisioning the future, looking at 2050 from the perspective of people who have between 20 and 30 years old. So, uh, so they are totally ready not only to envision, but to shape, to contribute to shaping the future. You can have each one of you a mic from here, and we will have a, a very inspiring discussion as we were so much inspired uh, by your um, by your project and presentations yesterday if you don't mind staying uh, standing so we can have a more dynamic discussions uh, uh, together so um, for those who arrived today uh, so our 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 three winners of the youth leadership award they are winners among more than 142 i think applications from all over the world they won this um, uh, so Youth Leadership Award, and, and uh, so we have Ashwarya at first winner, so she won the, the, the first prize, uh, Stanley second, second prize, uh, and uh, Malu and the third, third prize. So uh, very proud of you, and we want um, to be inspired by you. I mentioned to you one month ago a journalist who was writing about this uh, forum that will be will be uh, so convened in, in September. The last question she asked me, what is your source of hope and inspiration? And I told her at that point, the, the winners of this award who will, will meet when they will come to Geneva to receive the award. So you are my source of hope and inspiration and I'm sure for all the audience here. So first question. First question, and it will be the same question for all of you. So you, whoever is ready, can uh, can answer when you look yesterday too i think from you asked us to close our eyes to imagine you know your your project i think it was it was you i mean the guys <laughs> you did it okay then okay so they have to start now i will ask you uh, not necessarily to close your eyes but to look at 2050 25 years from now what is the world that you want to see and then i will ask you what will be your contribution to make this world become a reality. Who would like to start? I'll, I'll go first. Go ahead. Thank, Thank you. you so much for the amazing question, Fadi. Um, when I got the invitation that I'll be on the panel, I, I, I thought I was you know, really excited about the opportunity to kind of share a vision and event opportunity for uh, 2030 and then 2050 because we, we have a solid vision for 2030, but I got on call my co my co-founder who is at Harvard and I said, Mohammed, what is our vision for, for 2050? You know, we actually had to sit down and really think about that because that's a very long time from now. But I think that it was really important for us to start having those thoughts right now and kind of preparing ourselves towards, uh, towards that particular future. Personally, 
my vision for for twenty for for twenty fifty has to do with really empowering um, um, internally displaced learners within sub-Saharan Africa because I think education is not really just about learning. Like for the average internally displaced student who has faced conflict, whose school was probably burned down, who has lost access to education, it's, it's not really only about learning. You know, it, it's all about empowerment. It's about giving them the opportunity to see a bigger and a brighter future for themselves, a future that they will not be able to have access to if they don't gain access to education. And so uh, we want to expand our work um, by 2052, the entire sub-Saharan Africa. Um, by 2030, we are looking at West and Central Africa. By 2050, we are looking at um, sub-Saharan Africa. And to, to, to realize this, we believe that it is very important for us to leverage the power of collaboration. For example, Africa, Omujani Nguvu, Utengano Yudaifu, it's Swahili divided with four. By the way, that's the only Swahili I know, so I can't teach you Swahili if you have to learn. And I think that that's really the importance of collaborating to achieve this vision. And we have to collaborate with global ethics. You have to collaborate with other big players to be able to really expand our work to sub-Saharan Africa. Wonderful. Thank you. The second question later, but you can start thinking about it, is what kind of leader you will see, you see yourself being in 2050. You will have almost my age in 2050. So you see, I'm, I'm an old guy. So you, you, you will answer this question later. But... Uh, uh, who would like to? And just let me say also for those who were not here yesterday that Maluyan is is leading an amazing project using technology for education for those who do, uh, do not have access to school. Uh, and and an amazing project, e mentor, I think the title of the project. So, ready? Ahead? Please. Okay. Go ahead, um, Ashura. Okay. So, uh, so 2050 seems like really far away, but then time passes by really quick, right? So 2030 is almost here and 2050 will also be here soon enough. So I'm a social worker by profession. I have two nonprofits back home. One works for mental health awareness and the second one works for systemic inequality for Dalit communities. So my first organization was Antardhoni Nepal. We provide free mental health services across Nepal, focusing on places which do not have access to mental health at all. So through this organization, we are currently have supported about 10,000 Nepalese so far. And by 2030, we plan to extend it across uh, whole Nepal and then reach out to as many people as we can. Um, at the moment, we are only providing uh, in-person counseling services, but then we are trying to integrate tech dimension into it as well so that we can, with less resources, we can reach out to even more people. So that's the work that we're doing through Antartoni. And then through Heart of Nepal, the presentation that I did yesterday. Um, so I'm working with my mentor who mentored, uh, we, I got through this forum as well. And we are trying to integrate STEM education because that is so important in these days, even to get job opportunities and everything. So, uh, sorry, I will interrupt sorry. you to ask you with what you are doing now, how you see Nepal, because this project yeah. is so important for Nepal and the other one working mm -hmm. with the Dalit community also, but how would see it in 2050? What is yeah. where okay. it will take us? So we will be probably be reaching to more communities, more Dalit communities. There are a total of 4.6 million Dalit communities in Nepal. We plan to reach to all of them by 2050. Okay. That's the. So we'll have another Nepal in 2050 due to this hopefully, great work that you are doing. I'm sure. Hopefully, definitely. I'm sure. So definitely. wonderful. Okay. So uh, Stanley. Uh, you have also an amazing project, uh, very creative, innovative project also. Uh, so in transforming or in uh, recycling uh, for energy also to, to, to bring light to the dark rooms. That was amazing also that you shared with us. But now forget the, for a minute the project, look at 2050, where you want to see the world in 2050? What kind of world you would like to live in in 2050? I think I really took time like my colleague said, 2050 is a long time. I think, yeah, I'll be as good, hopefully I'll be as good looking as you are <laughs> by 2050. But um, I don't, think... Don't trust the appearances, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I because think... Because I would love to be like you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think my, my vision extends beyond the current work we are doing at providing lighting. I see myself as a leader in the tech space, in the design space, okay. and... Apart from that, I see myself as a leader that should bring technology into humanitarian impact. And the future I see is a future where there's an equitable future for everyone through access to technology, innovation, and so many different things. The fundamental right that 
drives everything is of course energy but also technology in the current world we're existing technology has the ability to provide millions of access to drinking water cleaner air better roads um sustainable housings affordable housings and i'm currently working on multiple projects apart from lighted so in the future in 2050 i see myself running multiple companies organizations that are using technology and recycling technology to provide people access to so many different solutions. And um, let's say I will be kind of a humanitarian um, Elon Musk, but not Elon Musk is not a good uh -huh. example, but yeah, <laughs> but Musk more of, humanitarian. <laughs> yeah, in the humanitarian <laughs> space, but in a very good way, in an okay. ethical way. <laughs> and I see myself driving unlimited change using technology. That is the future I see in 2050 for myself as a leader. Wonderful. Thank you know now why I said you are the source of inspiration, not only for me, but for all of us and for so many, I hope, thousands and millions of youths in the world, will, you, will, you will inspire also and will have more leaders. And so we still have less than one minute. I will just very, very quickly ask you if there is one thing you want to fix in the world. So we heard education, social work and social justice and innovation. Uh, what is the most important thing that not you, you want to fix? You want the leaders of this world today to take a decision. You know, in three weeks, the, all the head of states will meet in New York. They will take important decisions which will have impact on our lives. So if you have the floor to tell them one thing to all those leaders to take a one decision in a few seconds, what would be this, uh, this request, this, this, uh, this challenge that you, you would address to the leaders of the world? Let's start with you, Stanley. Oh, <laughs> um, I think the current state of the world that touches every young person right now is the wars that are happening. I think it would be to stop the wars. I think it doesn't matter if innovation drives, war destroys everything. And I think, wow. just why don't wow. we stop? Wow, that's very strong. I promise we'll try to take this to New York with us. We'll be there in three weeks and I promise that we will, we will say this. Uh, uh, this request, we'll try to share it as much as possible there. So whatever innovation we are we are doing and creating war can destroy everything. Yeah. So stop wars, wonderful. So I don't want to push you, but who is ready? Go ahead. Plus one, Ashwarya. what Stanley said, I completely agree that wars and genocide must stop. Apart from that, uh, while talking about multilateralism, all countries need to be equal. Even in the United States, the veto powers must go. And e every country that there is need to have equal voice and equal you know, power to dictate. Yeah. Wonderful. Veto should go. Yeah. Wonderful. I also promise we'll echo this, uh, this inclusive way of looking at our global humanity. So, and that... Uh, we are all equal and countries also count and uh, and all equal. Thank you. Thank you so much for us. So, well, yeah, yeah, your, yeah. your final turn. word so, <laughs> yeah, to, I mean, to, the, to, the, to the leaders of the world. What do you say? The political leaders, because you are also part of the yeah. leaders of the world, but they are the political ones. Yeah. I think my, uh, they have actually said very good points. And there's one thing that I want to add to what they've already said is they should create more inclusive spaces to empower other leaders and give them the opportunity to. Um, leverage their potential to create impact. Wonderful, wonderful. So if you were inspired by those words, please applaud and, and, and congratulate again our winner. Thank you so much. on LinkedIn, those are their names and they're also in the program. You can follow them on LinkedIn as well to see what happens next. Thank you. Wonderful. So now I would like to invite also the panelists of our uh, our panel to continue the same reflection, same discussion. So around this uh, uh, vision of the future. I will take the seat if you don't mind, if you can be here. Yeah. So I can see you all. Please, there is no order. So please, uh, Professor. Also. Okay, I will go in the middle. So I will give you this mic here. So we continue the reflection, as I mentioned, under the same topic. So 
foresight panel, but uh, what are our visions? Because of course, there are many visions for 2050, not one of them. And, uh, and maybe more important, what are the roadmaps that takes us to, to this uh, envisioned 20, 2050? We have a really amazing panel to, to discuss these questions, intergenerational, multi-sectorial, interdisciplinary, you will, you will see, you will hear, and this is also, as you saw during the whole forum, in fact, that we want this, this forum to be a multi-stakeholder, intergenerational, intercultural platform to, 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 uh, to think about our current global ethical, ethical challenges. So let me briefly present the panelists, and then we'll start immediately the, the, the discussion. So we have, uh, so from my left, uh, Sidra Raslan. We are so uh, grateful, Sidra. You made the, the, the trip from Barcelona to, to join us. Sidra is a, is a um, very active uh, young person in the Creative Leadership Youth Program at uh, Initiative of Change Co uh, Foundation, but also having many other uh, engagement on the youth level, uh, inner development, refugee rights, uh, climate change, and, and so on. And, and you have, a, I think, a master in environment, economic and social studies. So, uh, so thank you for, for being with us. And uh, so uh, uh, next to Sidra, Marie-Laure Sal, I think you all know her because we, we are uh, her guests in, in, her, in her institution here, so the director uh, of um, the Geneva Graduate Institute. Uh, but before also uh, being at the head of this beautiful uh, institute in Geneva, so she was also the dean of the School of Management and Innovation. And uh, this innovation perspective is is, uh, is important uh, uh, for us. And I really appreciate always reading uh, your reflections, uh, always very ethically rooted, sociological, anthropological, philosophical uh, uh, questioning and 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 reflections about uh, about uh, the current uh, situation of our world, and then next to me Stephen Hartman, uh, so founding executive director of the Bridges, very interesting Bridges Sustainability Science Coalition in UNESCO. So a bit long title, but a very very important institution under the umbrella of uh, of UNESCO. So looking at sustainability from a from a uh, interdisciplinary i would say but also with big focus on humanities uh, to uh, to envision and 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 work for the future um, because this i think the the nucleus of this of this project also started uh, in uh, in if i'm not mistaken in the um, bridges hub in arizona state universities as a uh, global futures uh, uh, laboratory. And, and uh, with Bridges, we have a, a very strong partnership, I would say, especially in relation uh, uh, to the process of the Pact of the, for the Future. We'll be soon together in New York again with other uh, partners uh, uh, having a site event, always pushing for a more concrete engagement for the, from the policymakers uh, to be able to implement uh, in the perspective in an intergenerational, intercultural, inclusive perspective of our future. So thank you, Stephen, also to uh, uh, join us. So uh, on my right, I would also like to thank uh, Thierry, Thierry Valray, who uh, joined us. He's the managing partner of Monthly Barometer. I encourage you to look at it on the internet. You will, you will really um, benefit from the insights and information provided by, by the Monthly Barometer and founder of the Summit of Minds. And I would like to thank you in advance because we'll meet again. Uh, thanks for your invitation. So in Chamonix, this is uh, maybe more, uh, I mean, Geneva is beautiful, but uh, having a Summit of Minds in Chamonix is uh, maybe a competitive to, to Geneva uh, somehow that will uh, convene soon there on always debating the most uh, pressing topics uh, about, about uh, the global uh, uh, situations. Uh, you have a, a, a very rich background, including in um, investment and in, uh, in, in multi-sectoral uh, uh, approaches, but also author of a new book uh, entitled Death at Davos. We'll talk about it uh, a, bit, uh, a bit later. Um, Emanuela, welcome also. So you are professor of political theory at the Department of Political Science and International Relations at the University of Geneva. 
and uh, but also with the focus on of margins of corruptions and and other topics that definitely will shape the future of our our world in the coming decades and um, so i'm also very honored to to welcome professor marcel van der Boot. so i think uh, uh, you all also know uh, professor marcel um, a consultant uh, playing major roles on on global and in global institutions uh, beginning from here, Geneva CERN, uh, next to us, to the EU and Brussels, uh, NATO, and other global institutions, as advisor, uh, uh, chairman of research councils worldwide, and so on. So uh, uh, thank you for bringing also to us your, your global wisdom, uh, and especially on this institutional level. So let's start, let's start our, our discussion, and maybe I would like to continue engaging uh, the youngest generation among us. So, so Sidra, if you don't mind, we, we, we can start uh, uh, with you. So first I would like to, to, to ask you, of course, always keeping this vision of 2050, uh, but uh, you are part of this, uh, and uh, not only part, but co-coordinating director of the Creative Leadership uh, Youth Program. So, um, so if this Creative Leadership Youth Program uh, uh, want to focus on one objective to achieve in 2050. What would be this objective for you? Mm. Uh, hi, everyone, and thank you so much for having me. Um, first, I'd like to address um, the idea of talking about 2050 because it, I realized it brings me a lot of uh, discomfort talking about something that is 25 years later when I believe the issues we are facing are happening right now, and it's like I feel like we didn't manage to come close to our 2030 goals. So instead we're giving ourselves like a fake deadline. That's like we're pushing the deadline further to give ourselves more comfort when I see that there's so much happening right now that we cannot afford to push the deadline anymore, like much further. And I believe I see this happening like amongst youth. And this is why I'm uh, within creative leadership, which is the initiatives of change youth team. Uh, I love working with them because we all feel the urgency that's happening now. Uh, and this is something I loved everyone that spoke throughout like the past few days of the conference, but I didn't feel like there was the sense of urgency that I see when I'm talking to young people um, around us. And we cannot afford to have uh, more 40,000 more people killed. We cannot afford to have any other genocide uh, happening before we start taking action that is like that is needed right now. Uh, so yeah, with creative leadership, we're uh, we're youth led. We're volunteer. We're all volunteers, so we're all spending um, our uh, free time, whatever free time we have, uh, to create uh, the change we see and uh, we we see that uh, that is needed and. Um, we create um, space, like we're trying to create a community uh, of authentic leaders because we realized whenever we ask a young person, like, do you consider yourself a leader? They're always like, no, because we see so much mistrust with leaders that we are not comfortable with the word, the term now. So we're trying to reconceptualize that uh, to, and this is why this is a very important forum because like ethics need to come back to leadership. Uh, and also we're trying to reconceptualize leadership and uh, also under the, the initiatives of change vision, which is stewards, stewardship. And it was mentioned in the conference as well, uh, which is leadership is a form of service. It's not someone that's in power uh, taking decisions on other people. It's an act of service. Someone mentioned that it was uh, a privilege to be a leader uh, or yeah, it's a responsibility also to be a leader because you're, uh, a steward towards the community around you. And, um, and yeah, in creative leadership, we're also trying to bring back the term, uh, the act of service that exists within leadership. And we're doing that a lot through storytelling, and uh, which is amazing. We, are host we have programs and conferences that uh, um, bring back that, okay, I am here. I don't want to just list my, list my achievements in order for a young person to be inspired by another young person, I need to hear that we are the same. And even though we're very different and diverse, but in my conflicted region, it's the same as a different conflict region. Uh, and we're all trying to create change. So whenever 
uh, I started even with the like young leaders here, we started speaking yesterday and I was like, wow, like they're in Syria, we're having so many uh, same problems as in Nepal and as in um, Nigeria. And because of the act of storytelling, we didn't start listing achievements to see who's doing what. We started with like storytelling. Um, so yeah, let's- Wonderful. Uh, so thank you. I was really struck by this sense of urgency that you that you expressed, you know, I was- not expecting to hear from a, the youngest person on this panel, the sense of urgency, but this is also, I think, very, um, very, very important to take in consideration from, from also uh, our side in this, in this reflection. Thanks. And I know that you not only are not only doing the chance, but you are being the chance that we want. And this is a whole storytelling behind that you, uh, you just mentioned. We'll go back to you with other questions. But uh, based on this, uh, uh, Marie-Laure, I'm tempted to ask you, what are you doing then here in this institute with young people like Sidra, you know, that who have this sense of, of urgency to face what's happening now? And they, they are telling us we cannot afford to delay uh, further, you know, uh, uh, targets. So how do you look at it from this educational perspective? Thank you very much, Fadi. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me too, and, and welcome to all of you in this uh, beautiful uh, amphitheatre, uh, which is part of, uh, as was said, the Geneva Graduate Institute. Uh, I was very, very aligned with this notion of urgency. Uh, I think this is something that, that also I had some trouble thinking about 2050. Well, especially, I won't tell you what age I'll, I'll have them because that would be a problem. But uh, so I think that, you know, I'd rather answer the question, what are we doing already in a sense for um, this new generation of, of leadership that, that we all need, all badly need? I'll start first by saying, how, how, how do I see this new generation of leadership? And then I'll, I'll try to, to focus on, on a number of things that we think are, are very necessary. So uh, clearly, I'm, I'm really sorry I didn't, uh, I was not able to, to, to be here the former days, but I'm sure you discussed that in and out, so I'll be very fast. But obviously what we will need are leaders that are complex and uh, are uncertainty ready in a sense, um, because this is the world we are in already, not the world of 2050, but already the world we are in. Uh, I also very much uh, agree with what uh, the previous uh, um, um, leaders said on the importance for peace at the center of, 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 uh, of who we want to train. And this institute has been born with peace at its heart because it was born with the emergence of the League of Nations and with this conviction that uh, we needed uh, international collaboration for peace. So peace is another very uh, strong pillar uh, and peace orientation is a strong pillar of what kind of leader uh, we need. Uh, and finally, this was also said by Sidra, uh, responsibility and responsibility, particularly for common good issues uh, and, for, and for each other. In a sense, um, you know, from that, from, from this is the objective, we want to, to produce, uh, it's not a good word, but to, you know, uh, create conditions for leaders to emerge who are actually uh, go going to uh, uh, exemplify those dimensions. Uh, what do we need to do? In a sense, I like to talk about uh, a building project for the 21st century. So going back to actually this notion of, uh, creating, um, you know, responsible uh, and thinking citizens that was part of the building project of uh, von Humboldt in the 19th century, but actually projected into the 21st century into a world that is uh, not going to be a nationally based uh, world, but a very transnational based, a very global world where issues are, are completely shared and common. So this is really how uh, I, I like to see it. And so how do we do uh, that? Um, you know, I see two, two main dimensions on, on the complexity savvy and, and uh, uncertainty ready uh, dimension. We need to push things that we've been pushing at the Institute and we just are accelerating, which are obviously critical thinking and which is particularly uh, necessary and will be 
you know, augmented to some extent by the need to have a strong critical thinking around technology in particular and the ways in which technology, yes, can be a solution, but it, it, we should really you know, create the conditions for it to be a solution and not a problem because it can also very much be a problem. So this critical thinking needs to be imported on future leaders with the capacity to be, be the masters of the technology and not to be, you know, mastered by the technology. So I would enlarge the notion of critical thinking. Uh, I would add to critical thinking curiosity, innovation, and creativity, because we need critical thinking that turns into creative thinking, because we need new solutions. So we have to combine uh, those things. Um, we, we have also, uh, obviously, we're mobilizing, uh, you know, uh, trust disciplinarity. This has been a, a mark of this institute, and, and we are pushing this further, but we are going also beyond trust disciplinarity towards systemic thinking, which is not obvious in the university world, because we tend to think in an analytical terms, so systemic thinking is another, another part. So that's on one side. On the other side, and that's the mobilization, going back to values, this has been said by many of you, so I'm going to be fast going back to values at the heart of uh, uh, leadership um, training and, and going towards this authentic leadership, which is also a term that I use a lot. And for that, uh, you know, some of the values we identify and we create conditions for, for this to be practiced because those values can be practiced, they can be uh, developed in, in, uh, in all of us. Uh, courage is one, obviously. Uh, integrity, which really is very connected to authentic le leadership, is another one. Um, so hope, we, but in a French sense, which is espérance, which is a very positive and not a passive way uh, and very proactive way of engaging the world, is another one that we uh, see as important. Benevolence in the sense of thinking that we are not going to solve issues for ourselves and just on ourselves, but this is going to be a collective project. So the capacity to understand each other, to work with each other and to collaborate instead of compete. So this is another really a very important evolution uh, compared to, to the world of education in general, where competition tends to be very uh, important. And uh, finally, trust. And I'll stop here because I've been too long. But that's, that's wonderful with this list of values that you finished with, I mean, um, courage, trust, integrity, uh, the uh, amazing, I think, because uh, there is no future without those values, I think, and uh, and this is uh, the key message. But I also um, heard you saying that uh, that the, the the current world is more driven by international or transnational dynamics dynamics than rather than only national or nationalistic uh, focused agendas. Also, so so I I turn to you, Stephen, because. The Bridges Project is within the framework of a multilateral organization, UNESCO, which mandate is to build peace in the mind of people, you know, and so answering the the hopes also of the of the young winners of the of the award and what we are discussing here. Uh, so, um, and again, in three weeks will be New York, the launch of the Pact of the Future, the engagement in this process. So, how do you look at the multilateral system? I mean, we heard one of the young people saying, uh, I, I want, I think before I said, I want every country to count as all the, as the others. I mean, and, and so to be more equitable somehow on the international relations level also. So how do you look at this at this uh, framework multilateralism of multilateralism and 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 see it as a as a tool to reach a better 2050 uh, horizon? Um, thank, thanks for the question. And um, yeah, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with what we heard from one of our prize winners at the, at, <clears throat> at the beginning and what we've heard in other parts of the program uh, during the day today. Uh, I'm reminded by that comment, you know, about the need for, for member states and, and, for, and for countries to um, be equal of the, of the element in George Orwell's Animal Farm, where when a constitution is formed by the animals, the first article in the constitution is that all animals are created equal. And then eventually another point gets added to the constitution that some animals are more equal than others. Um, and this is unfortunately the state um, of <clears throat> multilateralism to a large extent. Uh, that's an unfortunate state of multilateralism. And uh, one of the things that I'm hopeful 
that we can see in a reinvigorated and a revisioned uh, multilateral system and even a, a re-envisioned United Nations is uh, certainly uh, an equality among nations that doesn't have some nations more equal than others, um, but certainly as well that looks to the gaps that exist. Where is the space in the United Nations for indigenous peoples? Um, indigenous peoples which make up a little less than 5% of the world population, but um, whose lands encompass 80% of the remaining protected biodiversity um, and 36% uh, of our forests. Um, so it isn't only that they are, that they are um, protecting and managing these crucial resources for our world um, and have been doing for a very, very long time, often successfully. Um, it isn't only that, but uh, we, you know, uh, we certainly need to be thinking about how we're going to continue to pro protect these resources. But when the very people um, who are uh, responsible for managing um, and shepherding uh, these resources uh, aren't given a, a proper space to be able to actually engage as cultures, as peoples, um, that's a serious problem. I think the same thing can be extended certainly to, to other constituencies, other groups, other communities, youth, we've heard it before, you know, I think that we, um, when I think of the conversations that have taken place over the last year, leading to the pact of the future, the zero draft and the pact of, pact of the future that's going to be developed, that has been developed further in successive drafts and the other normative document, the, the Declaration on Future Generations, which our event uh, in New York uh, as part of, the, um, as part of a, a network or a coalition that involves Globe Ethics and some of the other partners we've seen here um, at the forum, like the Club of Rome and UNESCO and Learning Planet Institute. Uh, we, um, uh, we're really going to be focusing on how do we actually realize those ambitions and part of that process has been to have youth consultations. Um, there was one yesterday, um, a, a short one that happened in the context of this forum. In two days, we go to Paris. We're going to have another one at the Learning Planet Institute, a youth consultation that's meant to sort of foreground and give an opportunity to put at the center of things, the concerns, the visions, the hopes, the fears uh, and sense of vulnerabilities and possibilities that young people from all over the world um, really would like to see enter more fully into the discussion um, at the Summit of the Future in a little more than two weeks time. Um, so we wanna bring these perspectives and we wanna move on beyond the Summit of the Future in our efforts within this coalition to continue to have consultations and to bring more inclusively and in a more diverse sense more of these actors, um, uh, youth actors from different communities around the world um, so that we can continue this work and bring it to other multilateral and intergovernmental contexts where there's an opportunity to shape policy. Um, that's part of our larger vision over the next year where things aren't sort of ending at the summit of the future as far as our engagement and where we wanna see this go. But I think to do that means to recognize that there are distinct limitations to current multilateralism that by 2050 have to be long resolved, um, where civil society has a more active role, um, where other constituencies, uh, indigenous peoples I've mentioned already, um, but there are other traditional communities and there are other um, uh, voices and perspectives that don't have a proper role in a multilateralism that really only recognizes as equal um, and only sometimes partially equal uh, member states. Uh, there's much more to the world that we need to engage and draw on and bring to, uh, uh, to creative solution making um, that falls outside of that vision of multilateralism. So that's where I would begin. Wonderful, thank you, Stephen. Uh, very promising also for, to continue this reflection and discussion from now until uh, the Pact of the, for the Future and, and beyond. Um, 
Thierry, I would like to ask you, because we heard already that uh, Marie-Laure mentioned, I think, the world of uncertainties we already live in, and, and, and we heard the complexities described also by, uh, by Stephen now. And I was wondering, uh, and also the need to, to integrate other stakeholders also in, in, this, in this process, multilateral process or any process of change that we, we want to, to, to make happen. Uh, but at the same time, I was wondering, do we need more complex system or, 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 or more simple systems to get to better results, you know, in this more global, I would say, uh, uh, vision of things. And, uh, and let me mention here, I have um, not yet the opportunity to read your, your latest book, uh, which is uh, with a like intriguing and funny title, Death in Davos. But, uh, but I was wondering when I saw the title, I said, are you thinking that there is something already dying in the capitalist market-based world that you, are, you want to reflect in this ceremony uh, somehow? Or you wish uh, you look at a change that should happen uh, somehow from a systematic per systemic perspective, I would say, in our world to get to better results and to, to be able to, to move in the right direction? I will give you my, my or you can you can use uh, so to keep the control yes, of sir, thank you thank you very much thank you for having me and before before starting i'd like to make two points pertain to to the subject that we are we are talking about which is vision for 2050 um so there are two issues with that F first um as um, carlos braga a brazilian economist said several years ago vision without execution is hallucination that's what it is. We all share a vision, and I think in this room, since there is a high correlation between ethics and our values, I presume that all of us have this vision of a world in 2050 that is going to be less unequal, fairer, and also a world which is more respectful of Mother Nature. So this is our vision, I, I assume. Um, however, um, the vision has to be um, in adequation with um, our ability to implement our vision. And at the moment, we're not going that way uh, because of a problem of time asynchronicity. Uh, 2050 is very far away for some people. If you operate in the financial markets, your time horizon is two months, three months maximum. If you are the head of state of a democratically elected country, your time horizon is five years. And yet, as uh, Aishwayas, I hope I'm pronouncing your name properly, said, uh, for, for your generation, 2050 is tomorrow morning, because the decisions we're making today are going to express themselves in, in 2050. So when we look at 2050, it's already there in many, many respects. And the direction of travel is pretty clear, unless we alter the course of policy. So if we try to think about the world is going to be like in 2050, we can do so by using a very simple conceptual framework, which consists in looking at it through the prism of five macro categories, which are economics, the environment, geopolitics, society, and tech. Why is this five? Because any issue of global significance is bound to belong to one of these five macro issues. So there could be others, but this one I think is pretty simple and Pretty, pretty useful. So if we look at the trend as it exists at the moment, let's not beat around the bush. It is very disturbing. Economics, it's okay for the moment. However, as we move forward, we live in a world with less GDP growth, more inequalities, greater indebtedness, and trade tensions which will have a knock-on effect on growth. So it's not going to be as smooth as it's been uh, over the past 10, 15 years. The situation is exceedingly worrisome. And uh, the climate change, biodiversity degradation are the mother of all risks. Any decision we take today is bound to be impacted by environmental considerations, because it's going to be much faster than what everybody assumed just a few years ago. If, you, if we look at the um, geopolitics, it's very clear, more divisions, um, the you know, multilateralism is um, a path to 
chaos as we at the moment because we live in a world in which nobody's in charge. We don't even have a benign agreement as the US used to be a few years back. So the direction of travel is also quite concerning. Society, we live in a world marked by increased divides, polarization, marked by contempt, which is a very defining feature of today's world. And contempt is what prevents us to have a constructive conversation and come to an agreement around values and issues. And then there is tech. So tech is a big um, question mark. It's a big if. It could be that tech offers salvation because as we heard uh, in previous sessions, there are fantastic things happening around tech. And it could be that tech provides a solution to housing, to climate change, to inequalities, to many issues that beset us, but we don't know. It's a huge consequential uncertainty. And there are many dark aspects connected with the utilization of tech. So we don't know. So four of the trends are very distinctly negative. One is possibly hopeful, but we don't know yet. So I'd like for the moment to leave it at that. And um, I hope I didn't paint too big a picture because again, it's incumbent upon all of us to alter this course of events, which is leading us to a world that is pretty disturbing if we don't take action very soon. It is a, a dark picture <laughs> somehow to be, uh, to be realistic and, uh, and uh, it is a realistic maybe way of looking at, uh, at realities also through those five macro uh, structures. So, but thank you to also challenge us saying that it's not a 2050 straightforward uh, road for happiness and well-being. We have we lots. Uh, we have lots of pitfalls on the uh, on on our road uh, in this direction, and so we have more responsibilities. Uh, so, and this why I would like to turn to you, Emanuela. You are also um, educating young generations. Uh, um, so, political science, international relations, and uh, um, so what? What? What is your message for this young generation? about their role in building a better future through the institutions. So you, you have this also macro vision from a political theory uh, perspective. So, so what, what is the message that on a daily basis you try to, uh, uh, to, to pass to your student, young generation, to become the leaders we need to face those challenges and, and take us for a better future? You know, that's a crucial question that I think interrogates us to begin with uh, about what an institution is, to know how we can uh, drive any sort of change through institutions. A fundamental question is what are we dealing with when we are trying to imagine or reform institutions? And I think a key point here is to have very clear in mind that of course institutions are made of rules, mechanisms, procedures, but most importantly, they're made of people. The people that give a body to rules and that enact mechanisms and procedures. Therefore, any road to institutional change cannot rely on introducing new rules or reforming rules, introducing new procedures only. It is critical to have ethical training at the basis of institutional reform. And if I had to pick two main driving ideals for institutional reforms in this sense, so changing institutions by changing fundamentally the people that give body to an institution. Besides the very important personal virtues that Marie Lohr made reference to in characterizing the leader earlier on, I would also underscore two fundamental values that should characterize the relationships and the qualities of interactions between people within institutions. And those are accountability on the one hand. And again, I would uh, also call back in this context, trust. So generally we are uh, inclined to think and to do much research uh, about accountability and trust in terms of internal and external dynamics. So trust of citizens towards government, for example, and accountability, accountability of democratic leaders to the public. But trust and accountability are also important values that characterize or better should characterize the relationships between members of an institution. 
in order for institutions to work and to head in a critical and self-reflective direction. It seems crucial that the members of the institution can trust each other to be capable of sustaining the project of their institution, whatever they think it to be. And of course, within a multilateral systems of institutions that can uphold each other's work. And on the other hand, uh, accountability, accountability of members of institutions, one towards the other one, just to stop sometimes and do pretty much what people have been doing here over the past three days. What's the point of what we're trying to do together? So accountability in the sense of giving each other an account of the vision we have for uh, our institutions and how each of us can actually contribute as members of the institution to make sure that our interrelated work actually is heading in that direction. So this critical effort of self-reflection on what we're doing seems to be crucial in the context of reforming institutions, identifying challenges that are actually perceived as pivotal on a share basis and imagine ways to go towards them, not only by imagining new rules, but also imagining new practices in order to uh, grapple with the profound humanity that characterizes institution, which is at once its main limits and its main, its main potential. So key message, uphold mutual trust and mutual accountability between uh, the members of an institution in order to make institutions function in a more responsible way indeed, and actually take uh, and invite leaders to set the example, to take in their own hands the direction in which institutional action ought to go. And this is uh, what I believe uh, should be at the ground uh, of uh, an institutional ethics, an institutional ethics capable of uh, actually inspiring uh, change in a direction which is both critical, reflective, but also very well grounded in practice and not, um, what was the word you used, delusional or uh, when, when visions are not supported by hallucination. action, hallucination. So it's not hallucinatory, but really um, concretely headed in a direction for which people can actually feel engagement and commitment. Wonderful. Thank you, Emanuela. I was thinking, hearing you, that uh, uh, so it reminded me of the discussion yesterday about compliance and ethics, and so how also experts were telling us that more compliance is not necessarily the road for better or good governance. And so when you don't, I mean, you we lack the foundation, the ethical foundation of any institution. Uh, so that's that's very strong. But I will also take from your time in the second round and ask you again, if you don't mind, to take again the mic because what you said challenged one point. Uh, um, when we look today at the international relations and we see how impunity is being normalized, we are talking about mutual accountability, but in the current world system, I would say, and from a political uh, and geopolitical perspective, impunity is the word more than accountability. So, so, so how do we deal with this for a better future? Yeah, well, you mentioned earlier on um, the uh, one of the subject areas on which I'm working, that is corruption. And I guess if we look at um, corruption, just both major corruption scandals and very petty everyday corruption, we really see that impunity is a huge problem there. No? You see people getting away with uh, abuses of power uh, and misuse of resources in all possible, in all possible manners. And there is exactly where I think uh, mutual accountability can be seen as a positive image of this impunity or lack of accountability. So if anything, um, if there is a teaching that seeing corruption within institutions can give us, uh, is that corruption flourishes where accountability practices are lacking. Uh, so therefore, it seems that there, uh, the role of education, but not only education in universities, the kind of education um, we have before our eyes, but really implementing ethical training programs for people within institutions uh, capable of um, embedding and accepting uh, with this commitment to accountability and this, com this ethical commitment is the road to prevention, which is a way to uh, prevent and work 
before uh, something bad happens and we are required to try to catch up and then ask the question of how we catch the bad guy and how we punish them. So just try to work ahead. And uh, at, at the end of the day, if you think about it, it's a matter of taking the courage of changing institutional culture and the way in which you change institutional culture, organizational culture is by uh, in viewing institutions with a new ethical commitment. And this is exactly the role for these practices of accountability I was referring to in my view. Wonderful, thank you so much. So uh, Marcel, I'm turning to you because we had a previous discussion together that was extremely motivational for me, uh, hearing you saying the whole world needs global ethics, you were telling me, the, the, the world cannot function without ethics and we absolutely need uh, to to uh, to infuse ethics in all global institutions. So from this perspective, looking backward, uh, 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 how the many institutions you 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 worked with then advised and uh, and and uh, are somehow responsible of the state of the world where we are now, and then looking forward, how we can how we can at least not to repeat the same mistakes of the, of the past. So how ethics can play a role in, in, in this process? Thank you, Chairman. If I look a little bit about the whole world, we are going the wrong way. In respect to ethics today, it is like driving a car without red lines. You drive and you do what you want. If you are in a war, you do what you want. If you are an economist or a businessman, you produce and the ethics aspects are not neglected. I feel that on all continents from China, where I'm also a professor at the Tsinghua University, which is the best in Europe with America, South America, I think also Africa in this field, the tendency is that ethics is going down and we need more and more in the future. We are going to a very strange future. If you look to the technology, you are talking now about artificial intelligence, but we are also talking about a quantum computer and then you can neglect that. And we also, in 20 years from now, that is before 2050, we will have also the neuro technology. And this one will be a completely different and today, even at this important conference about the quantum computers of the neurotechnology, of many other technologies and developments in industry and the military topics and the technology which is developed, I think it is enormous. Ethics is vitally important, much more in the future than in the past. Now, I think that also at this conference, there were wonderful ideas and elements put forward. The last 20 years, a lot has been done at the Institute of Globe Ethics, and we congratulate these people. But at the end, we are on a plateau. We have done a lot, we are on a plateau. And if we don't do anything, we will go in a very dangerous situation in the future, in all kinds of areas. If it is climate change, if it is energy, if it is the countries, all these kinds of things should be have ethics from education, research, industry, everything. And for the time being, if I look about the European programs, they got to put a lot in economics and all that one. And in respect to the philosophy and in respect to all that one is secondary importance, but not only in Europe, that is in the United States, that is in China, that's in Tokyo, all over the world. And we are going in, a, in becoming a world which will be unbelievable to live in it. And we should have a world what we like. And I think ethics had to play there an important role. Now, my special message is the following. Today, also during the last days here, wonderful ideas had been put forward that was by ministers or parliamentarians, by ambassadors, by scientists, all kinds of people. 
wonderful ideas. But what is missing? What is the way? What is the roadmap in order to achieve the target of a good world in 2050 has not been mentioned. This is very difficult, but we need to have that. If we don't have that, we will go in a very dangerous kind of situation. Not only wars, it will be a war, but we will also have industrial wars and other completely wars and we will follow technologies and that. And the point of ethics is always neglected. How are we putting road ethics on the roadmap? How are we putting a target for ethics in 2050 with a roadmap from today to 2050? A roadmap with sub-targets, which are two plus two is four and not promises that we really achieve continuously that what we want to have in 2050. For the time being, I have not seen, not at this meeting, which is a fantastic meeting with wonderful ideas, but the way how to achieve them. Also the points which has been mentioned by various of these people here about energy of environment of, of all that one they will not be realized if we don't know how to realize them. And we should develop a mechanism, institutes, in order to do that. And I think I heard that also UNESCO was present on this table. I had a long experience with UNESCO and with the ethics topics, but nobody in the world is practically following them. There are some who are doing that, but we have a world which we have to improve and they are not followed. For the time being, we have nobody, we have nothing to follow. And also the ministers and, and parliamentarians who are doing, they promise, but at the end, I have seen in no country, in the United States or in Europe, but also in Japan, as I'm following that clearly, and Tokyo of Japan, but you can also, the whole world is that, that people are looking a little bit more egoistic to their own interest and they neglect a little bit of points which are also important. We have the obligation to find kind of rules, not only the rule, but a rule where two plus two is followed. And if that rule is not followed, you are punished for that one. And we have to create such a kind of an organization. And I really would encourage, a particularly Globe Ethics, we've done wonderful work but on a plateau, how to move it. Now it is very difficult for Globe Ethics to do that with the number of people that we have available, with the number of the budget, what is available, you cannot do that. We have to find principally a Globe Ethics which is internationally recognized, where a globe ethics is making advices of studies, making kind of laws that are applied and recognized and forced to be followed. And I think that you all should look particularly to your governments to see how we could create such a body as we need laws like driving a car. There are different kinds of lights, but you should not go through the red. What is the red light? Where will we get a punishment if we don't follow that? Thank and you. for the time being, we have the great problem. There are no kind of lights for the ethics. And I can tell you, Ethics is going down worldwide. And in future of what we need, it should go up, not slowly, but actively. And that is more or less the way oh, I would like to see it. Oh, it has not been done, the roadmap at this meeting, but I think it is absolutely necessary to think in the future as you need it. And if you don't do it, you will not create 
a 2050 world in which you would like to live. Thank, Thank you, you, Marcel. That's that's a wonderful challenge. Based on, uh, based on great trust also. I, I really appreciate your trust and uh, to put in Globetics and this challenge that you are giving uh, to all of us here to have a clear roadmap to avoid the hallucination or just, you know, having a vision without any executive or concrete roadmap uh, for it. So thanks. Um, we have a few, very few minutes left. So in 30 seconds for, uh, for uh, continuing from the side, maybe Emanuela asking you again. Uh, so um, if, you, if you want to um, put on the agenda, of the UN in three weeks, the Pact for the Future, whatever, uh, a, a one key decision that today we need to take to 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 guarantee a better future for all. So what would be from from this macro perspective? I would say what would be the one decision that that should answer a gap now. Well, to the extent that decisions should be uh, driven by a clear uh, objective uh, to be met. And as I mentioned earlier on, one of the key objectives uh, I see as a priority is to encourage the development of relationships of mutual trust and accountability within institutions. Then I would think that the direction is to invest concrete resources, funds, actual funds in uh, ethical training programs uh, for members of institutions. That would be uh, a baseline reform on the basis of which all the rest can come along. You can put all the rules you want. There will be always a way around respecting the rules unless there is an ethical commitment underneath. And the ethical commitment, you nourish it through training. So that I would see as key measure, money for ethical training. But that's a wonderful marketing for Globetics programs. And I did not ask you to do it. So, so thank you for this. And I cannot agree agree more. Uh, so Thierry, uh, uh, we were mentioning that next week, I think, Summit of Mind yeah. also happening. And you are a knowledge partner, your institution was, was the Global Ethics Forum. So what kind of synergy would you, what would you take from this discussion to to the next week also uh, Summit of Minds discussion in China. Well, what I can observe is that it's so easy to talk about these issues and the real trick is about making the right decisions. And what I've been observing for now a few years, we have head of state coming to, to Chamonix to the summit. We have you know, key decision makers. And a, a point that they make, which resonates with me very deeply, is that they feel that the world has become too complex and they feel overwhelmed by the task of the responsibility. And I think it's very true. We have to think about it. We have to think about the myriad of issues that every single decision maker has to deal with in a world that is incredibly fast paced, complex, transparent, which also makes it more difficult to, to, to govern in a world of complete transparency. You can't do very much. Um, so I have no response. To that point, uh, I think it's a call for humility. We just have to be incredibly humble and recognize that unless there is a global governance system put into place, none of these issues is going to be resolved because all of them are of a systemic global nature. That's what it is. Wonderful, wonderful call um, for humility that we also endorse. Uh, uh, Stephen, what, uh, what ins inspired you until now from oh, this? From this roadmaps that we are working on together? Well, <clears throat> among the things that have inspired me, one of the biggest things that's inspired me has been the uh, just the, um, the depth and the richness of the ideas that have been expressed here that indicate the, um, uh, the gaps that I mentioned before. It's, <laughs> those gaps are a problem of perception. Um, invisibility is not the fault of those people without the solutions or those without um, the creative solutions. Uh, it's the inability of the system in its sort of current form um, to recognize the value and the creativity and the abundance of possibility that uh, is recognized and suggested in, in Fora, such as this one. Um, and so my hope is that um, we will see, to come back to the idea of renewed multilateralism, a multilateral, uh, multilateral system um, with transparency, with trust and confidence that evolves to um, shine a light 
on where those gaps can be acknowledged right now and to bring more of those, um, more of those actors uh, inclusively into that process for a more effective uh, uh, governance, global governance um, that has uh, the ability to sort of um, be effective at many scales, both globally, internationally, regionally, nationally, locally. Uh, I don't think we're going to see that as long as um, there are those who don't feel that they're seen by that system. So uh, that's where my hope lies. Thank you. And uh, Mary Laura, I was thinking uh, also about uh, the public role of educational institutions, higher education institutions. So is there an, an additional role that those institutions can do to advance this agenda? Well, you know, education has to be understood at all levels, and that's really something important. We are here in the Institute of Higher Education, but we have to think of education. And this was said also by Emmanuel, also, you know, uh, later on in age, but also very, very early on in age. You know, but I, I think I would like to end with something else, if that's okay uh, with you. And, and what I would like to think uh, to end with would be a kind of an intellectual exercise where Let's imagine, let's imagine a world where we would put as much money as we are putting today towards war, where we would use that money to put it towards peace. And we would put it towards education, we would put it towards health, we would put it towards youth and women, we would put it towards the environment. Let's imagine that. Uh, you know, and so if I would like to say something to, um, you know, uh, the Security Council uh, and to, um, you know, the um, uh, UN uh, Assembly in, uh, uh, in New York, in, when you'll be there, I won't be there, but you'll be there, is how do we finally make the role of the UN as the killer of war, that's the role of the UN, huh? uh, how do we make that happen so that we can indeed, as you were saying before, put an end to the destruction of wars, which is actually destroying the value that humanity is creating. So this would be really my, my strong point at this stage. Wonderful. Thank you so much. The, the conclusive word is with you, Sidra. So whatever you would like to say, to this audience and those who are following us online and those who will also watch later and and uh, and engage with this content so share on behalf of all of us your final message here i think after a lot of the conversations we've had throughout this conference um one thing that struck me the most that was repeated a lot is uh, and this is the conclusion i get is to stop speaking on behalf of others to stop speaking and making decisions on behalf of youth and people in conflict areas on behalf of uh, nature and on behalf of women. Um, so the decisions related to the community should be coming from the community itself. Um, so yeah, to give the rightful voice to others. And that's something I'm taking with me as well. Wonderful. So please join me to thank all the panelists for this wonderful panel full of realism, humility, and hope also. So thanks, all of you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, panelists. Uh, if you can exit the stage this way, and we will prepare the stage for our uh, final closing remarks.
Ladies and gentlemen, if you could please have a seat and we will have final closing remarks from Executive Director Faridou. So when I opened the forum two days ago, I gave you two rendezvous. One is happening now, the conclusion of the forum, and the second one next year for the following edition of the forum. Because um, as I already mentioned, this forum is not only an event, it's a process, and I would say a bit more uh, about this. But first of all, let me just tell you that I want, and I will be, it, despite the great uh, notes that I received from, from our team, uh, as a summary of the of the discussion that we have been having, listening to, and engaging with during the whole forum, those three days. Uh, but I um, I have to confess that it's impossible to say this in five minutes. So you will receive the policy report, the outcome of the discussions of this um, of this forum soon, the soonest possible, to continue our uh, so nurturing our our reflection and discussions and build on this. Uh, further engagements all to, altogether. Um, but I will just, I want just to share with you uh, three conclusions that I personally made in a very brief way about uh, uh, the whole discussion that uh, uh, we had uh, in the beginning of the forum. The first one, it struck me so much that the central topic that, um, that we started with the forum, we opened the forum with the question of peace and inclusive peace, that was the final word of the of the of the uh, uh, panel that we just uh, uh, had now, um, and and uh, hearing from the the young leaders and also the senior expert how much peace is central to build a better better future and a better world, and I think this is this is um, uh, so uh, evident as um, as the truth. Uh, and 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 probably so neglected as a reality. I think uh, Marie Laure mentioned now that uh, the role of the UN. I mean, and I I am known to be somehow harsh when I speak about the multilateral system nowadays because I think we don't need such an expensive system to do humanitarian work. The UN was created to prevent wars and to and to uh, to strengthen peace and uh, and have sustainable peace in our world and resolve conflicts when they happen, and not just to do humanitarian work. We have international organizations who are, are doing wonderful work in this field. So definitely, 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 we need to, we need the kind of reset. This was discussed also during uh, some of the panels. We need a new, a renewed multilateral system uh, uh, that is able to prevent wars, not only to resolve conflicts and to kill wars, but to prevent wars by uh, enhancing uh, and sustaining peace all over, all over the world. Uh, while saying this, I'm, I'm very aware, and we saw, I think if you remember, if you were there the first day, the very engaging and moving, emotional uh, two panels we had on the role of uh, uh, ethical and spiritual leaders in uh, protecting lives, saving lives in times of wars and atrocities. How we heard from extremely engaged and, and uh, 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 sincere and authentic uh, spiritual leaders saying we are being unable to do it because when we ask uh, uh, leaders from one side to take a position against atrocities and, and violence, they would say, but my son is, is in the army. And when we ask the other side, we'll say my son is in the, in the prison. So um, peace is, is, is uh, the utmost need 
but we need a mechanism to to ensure that we will we will uh, be able to uh, to offer peace to the to the uh, gen younger generation and the new generations to come. My second conclusion is about inclusivity. We heard while the discussions were focusing on artificial intelligence uh, and and other topics also how much uh, and I think Sidra just said also um, uh, don't don't decide on behalf of the other don't don't uh, let let the communities let the young people let let everyone who is concerned to be involved in the in the process of finding the solutions and implementing those solutions and this is definitely leading to more complex world and and Thierry I think are saying now that if we are in a more complex world and more transparent world this means that also it's more difficult to manage uh, the world in this way but maybe we need we need to invent we need to be creative and i think this is also a big gap it's um uh, uh, my and this is this is a personal um, statement here uh, i think that we are we are trying to run and to rule the world a new world a completely new world with old systems and this is one of our major uh, challenges i think nowadays so we need more more creativity more innovation to uh, to make the needed new systems uh, to be born, to be out there, to be tested, to be to be used uh, for better results in our um, in our world. And finally, um, my last uh, personal conclusion, also from this from this forum, is the need to continue the discussion about ethical leadership and ethics, because ethics is the foundation, it seems, of all the solutions. Uh, but we still don't know or exactly know how we operationalize this. We heard about training, we heard before in the sessions on education and AI education and the future of education, uh, that how, how much ethics should be central in, in those processes, but it's still uh, not enough. We need to ensure that we have uh, the capacity to operationalize this and to, to, to make the shift happen and to have more uh, value-based uh, thinking, um, decision makings, and actions also through ethical leaders and and ethical leadership. So those are my very brief um, notes and personal conclusions uh, from this extremely uh, rich and engaging forum. I would like to thank again all the speakers, uh, seventy-eight speakers from thirty-four countries, six continents. I think with thirty-two knowledge partners, organization. Amazing, um, amazing network of of uh, of thought leadership, of of partnership. I think with this force that is represented by the Global Ethics Forum, we can move things. Humbly, we heard this word uh, now in this panel with lots of humility, but also with lots of determination, because we cannot uh, we cannot be change makers if we were not courageous enough uh, uh, and and. Um, uh, so um, with lots of determinations uh, and belief that we can we can make the change. Uh, I would like also, in addition to thanking the speakers, uh, uh, the partners, uh, the sponsors, strategic partners who were mentioned at the beginning, and uh, I would like to mention again our two strategic partners, so Lindsay Foundation, long-standing uh, partners from the beginning of. Uh, uh, of Globetics and King Kong's uh, song, uh, uh, company, health company, who also supported this forum and the uh, Youth Leadership Award with Zurker Foundation, uh, with uh, um, so the city of Grand Saconé, uh, and I would like to greet among us uh, the mayor of the city here, who will hear from him also um, uh, his his words uh, now, and all all the other partners, Kaji, all those who who, who contributed to make this event. Possible. I would like to thank also the Graduate Institute Maison de la Paix who hosted this, uh, hosted us, and uh, during those three days in, in such a wonderful uh, uh, venue, such wonderful uh, place. Um, and uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, that uh, Global Ethics Forum is not just an event; it's a process. So we will continue our our engagement uh, throughout the year, and that's why we are launching today a. A LinkedIn group, a new page where you can now uh, scan the QR and and go to this uh, to this LinkedIn LinkedIn group. This is a group for thought leaders where we want to continue this engagement, this discussion all together. And this page will will uh, host and publish 
uh, again, all the videos of our sessions because the whole uh, the whole forum was live streamed, recorded, so you can go back to the discussions that happened to the to the panels. Uh, and in addition to uh, what you will yourself becoming members of this page, uh, and 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 so many other experts will join this page, continue publishing and continuing the discussion uh, uh, on this page. Uh, I said that uh, the, the second rendezvous uh, I was giving you, it's next year because uh, we will have another edition of this forum. It will be also in Geneva, not necessarily every year will be in Geneva, but next year it will be in Geneva again because we want also to confirm the centrality of Geneva uh, as, a, as a platform, not only for, for peace and human rights, but also for ethical leadership, because we heard so strongly that we won't have peace without ethics and ethical leadership. Um, and, and finally, so this is not the end of the event because we have now, we will be moving towards the festive part of the event. So we are just closing the, I would say the discussions uh, uh, and, and moving to something extremely important for us, two very uh, uh, strong moving milestones for the organization. So celebrating the 20th anniversary and uh, the 20th anniversary, not, not for, the, for an institution on the papers, but for people who made Globe Ethics to be such a wonderful organization. Uh, uh, from the beginning, Globe Ethics, it's a, it's a space where uh, uh, people join their forces to make, to make the good things happen. So, so we will be celebrating uh, this anniversary together. Uh, and then another extremely important milestone in the, in the history of the organization and its future also will have a ceremony of the handover of the presidency of, uh, of Globe Ethics. But I won't say more about this. I would just uh, conclude by thanking the team who was behind uh, uh, the organization of, of this forum before uh, handing... So before uh, asking my my colleagues uh, so to uh, to take the responsibility of uh, being the master of ceremonies, so Lucy, please, deputy executive director, uh, join me here on the floor. You will be the master of ceremony of the 20th anniversary. And Amelie, uh, where are you? Please, if you may join me. Also, you will be the master of ceremonies, our academic dean for the presidency handover. I want also to ask all our team who worked in an incredible intensive way to make this, this forum so successful. I want to start by the, I would say the coordination uh, team and stakeholder engagement team and program team. So uh, Alison, Wallace and Vance, please come join, join me here on the, um, on the stage. You did, you did a wonderful work, incredible. Honestly, I always push the limits, but you you uh, you put them further even with this uh, incredibly uh, successful program. I want to also to thank the communication team. Uh, incredible, also you saw. I mean, the whole communication behind behind such an event, and it's all stands on one point four. I think so. Two persons, of course, but not with full time. So Josie and Vero, please come and. Join us. Good. Uh, because we had also an intern who helped us, but she's not here. She just joined the, the team and she was Morgan supporting the communication uh, communication team, the logistic team. I think you were all in contact with, uh, with amazing people. So Manasa, Rebecca, please, Katrina, uh, uh, join us here because uh, also this would not uh, have been possible without a great, great uh, service uh, also delivered and uh, in the organization. And you notice that one of the maybe specificity of this forum is not just talking and, and sharing words, but also it's sharing uh, uh, the outcomes of, of previous reflections and, and uh, um, evidence-based data also that that is strongly uh, I think uh, like a strong foundations for for our uh, thought engagement so I would like to thank our uh, publication team who works in extremely 
24 hours hard uh, work to 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 have the the reports that were launched and the book that were launched uh, dur during this forum. So Ignace, Jacob, where you are, with also the support of the library team. So Andreas, Anya, please join us. And Globetics is not only based in Geneva. Uh, as I mentioned, if we were able to have uh, uh, so all the speakers and the partners from six continents, it's because we have regional centers and we have amazing regional managers in those centers uh, who did more than just working from their centers, uh, but also supporting uh, the whole work of the organization of the of the forum here. So thank you, all the region, regional managers. I will start uh, from uh, Argentina. So the uh, uh, Latin America and Caribbean center, Johenia, please. Vero is already here, I think. Yes, Johenia, join us. And thank you for the notes, for the for the summaries of this of this forum. That we they will be very useful also for the uh, for the final report. Then Globetics had the chance because we spoke a lot about Africa, and I always say Africa is the continent of hope, and this is why we have four centers on the African uh, continent. So Karike, please, Southern African center from from South Africa, Susan, Western Africa, Ghana, please, Herbert. Where are you, Herbert? Eastern Africa. And, and we have the Tunisian uh, center and, and Kamel representing, he's our council for the, for the MENA region, uh, and Susan supporting the center also, the, uh, the MENA uh, center. And then in Asia, we have so uh, the uh, South Asia in India, based in India, Rajula. Please join us and Lakshmi also with your two hats, the Indonesian center. I forgot anybody. Yeah. Yes, uh, it's 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 uh, for purpose. Please, Lakshmi, thank you. And then I can assure you, I allowed my, only myself to go beyond the time because I I know that Carolina will pardon me <laughs> because without her we could not uh, uh, able to manage uh, such an intensive program, having all all the panels on time, managed in an very amazing way. So thank you, Carolina, for having been an amazing, amazing uh, stage manager and, and program manager. So now we deserve a group photo altogether, but maybe we can, we can uh, come closer to each other. And, uh, 